Welcome to season four of And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. I've written with hundreds of artists and writers over the years, and my favorite part of each session is the first hour when we catch up about life, the industry, politics, composition, whatever. So this is a journey of learning why people write songs, how people write songs, and most importantly, who the people are who write the songs. I'm producing this with The Great Joe London, Big Deal Music Publishing, and Mega House Music Management. If you want to listen to the songs we discuss in this podcast, follow us on our socials, find out about special events, or buy some of our merchandise, go to our website, www.andthewriteris.com. Oh, and if you enjoy And The Writer Is, please rate and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever your preferred podcast listening site is. Today's podcast is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built for musicians, by musicians. Banzoogle makes it easy to build a professional website and EPK for your music. Whether you're looking to book more gigs or need an affordable solution to manage your direct-to-fan sales and mailing list, you can use Banzoogle's simple tools to design a website and store that both you and your fans will love. Go to Banzoogle.com to try it free for 30 days and use the promo code ATWI to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. That's ATWI to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. This week's episode is sponsored by BMI. Full disclosure, Joe and I are both BMI songwriters, so we didn't write this, but we believe it. BMI, we celebrate your talent, value your music, and champion your rights. To all our songwriters and composers, your passion is ours. BMI, music moves our world. Welcome to And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. Today's innovative multi-hit writer-producer is one of the most influential artists in the game. Still on the better side of 30, he's already penned number one worldwide smashes for the world's biggest rapper featuring the world's biggest pop star and been featured on another hit record with the world's biggest DJ and essentially wrote 100 percenter for one of the world's biggest radio presence pop stars. And still, none of that compares to what he's doing on stage as one of the industry's favorite artists. Riding this all-time Hi, he is a legend <laughs> live and a legend in the studio. He's producing and writing virtually 100% of all of his music and yet collaborates with a humility from which the whole community could learn. Oh my God, this is amazing. When did you write this? All the way from Long Island, <laughs> this man always puts his fans first. Love and the it. writer is my friend, Pound it, John <laughs> Bellion. Yes, 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 yes. Technically, oh. is it Bellion or Bellion? Bellion. Where Where does that come from? It's Italian. It's Italian. It's Italian. At do some you know? Point. Do you know where in Italy? Um, my family's from like Naples area, so I, I okay. don't I don't know like where per se specifically or like the root of the word and the origin. But have you been? No, Italy? I haven't. I was supposed to go on tour. We had a bunch of dates in Italy, but one of my buddies got hurt last year and we weren't able to go and we ended up canceling the tour, but we were supposed to go to Milan and a bunch of different places. We're going to go this year, so it'll be good. I mean, you have to find out, you know, the house of oh, your well, great, great oh, grandpa 100%, or something. 100%. I did the 23 Me thing, so I'll, yeah. f- I'll follow all the trails to get Is it? Are you, are you like 90%... Italian and ten percent Indonesian or something. Yeah, there was a lot of African American <laughs> that I didn't know about. That oh, I was, yeah, cool. a little high percentage and French Canadian, some random stuff. But yeah, m- most of it's Italian. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, let's start from the beginning. So, uh, yeah. so you're born in New York, yeah. in Long Island. Long Island to who? <laughs> <laughs> to Judy and Bill Bellion. I guess uh, my parents. Yeah, hey mom, they're gonna they're gonna listen to this. Nice. Like they do everything else. Um, yeah, just making beats as like a. Super young dude. My brother brought home like a Triton keyboard when I was in like fourth or fifth grade. Were your parents musicians? Not at all. My parents don't listen to like my mom introduced me to Paul Simon. She was a huge Simon and Garfunkel right. fan, like as a kid. Like yeah. that was my earliest like musical memories. But no, my mom can't. My dad and mom have not a musical bone in their body. You can't even sing on key. Like and but your brother comes home with a Trident. Yeah, my my, my brother was like a phenomenal 
accomplished piano player, like a like a learned eleven years lessons, like was a really great piano player, and just ended up buying like a keyboard one day. My sis, both my sisters sang in church. Both my sisters are like phenomenal voices. My sisters on all of my albums, like you could hear her on backgrounds and stuff like that. And my parents have like never encouraged like. Like they never, it was never like, oh, we grew up around music. My my dad was pl- playing on the guitar in the back porch. Like it was never that. It was just like. What are the order of kids? I'm the youngest. Okay. Two sisters and a brother. Did they want to pursue being, you know, lead, No, no. Lead my sister made or? like an album back when she was like super young, like in high school type of thing. But it just, you know, she went to college and she's a, she was a vet technician and now she's a full-time nurse. And it's just funny, like working on my albums that could potentially go out to like, Millions of people, and she's like, <laughs> is she getting after? Her? She's oh, she's she's like my A and R. I, I don't even have an A and R at Capital. Like she is literally the person that comes into the studio and is like, I feel like this could move and this. Really? Could do, oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, we're gonna find ways to get her some more money. <laughs> totally, um, totally, totally. So, how does a kid who grows up in Long Island, um, I don't know, how do you get discovered? Oh, oh, oh boy. <laughs> I it mean, you're, you're like, playing in you're playing in high. I mean, obviously, you've been playing music since you were how old? Forever. Did you get making, the trident? making beats, like and like singing and rapping on it, and just doing everything myself because I didn't want to wait for anybody else to do it. Like it just became an obsessive hobby from like I'd say really like eighth grade on. I was just doing everything, asking my parents for like Christmas, can you get me a, like a microphone and can you get me Pro Tools? And I'm reading online that Pro Tools is how you do it. So just learning things just with no help from nobody, no connections. I just loved it. So by the time I got to college, I played basketball in high school. Uh, I could have played basketball in college, but I ended up like just even throughout high school, like not going to practices and just like it's just beats like started yeah. taking over everything. It was just like an obsession, making joke songs. How with did friends you jump school, to beats and, versus you know Paul Simon? Like who who introduced you to to? It was always like an, an amalgamation of everything because my brother was super like. Wyclef and the Fugees and like Wu Tang and like and my sister was always super like Dashboard, Confessional and like Death Cab and like this all explains so, everything. Yeah. <laughs> so like, like seriously, couldn't describe like how would you describe your albums? You'd be like, okay, it's Wyclef and the Fugees and yeah and Dashboard and and, yeah. and Death Cab and throughout and simultaneously, I'm seeing like some Forty One on like TRL. Yeah. So I'm getting all of this like information from all these different places where when, at the ages of 12, 13, 14, 15, that's when music actually affects you. Mm-hmm. Like you hear M&Ms, like I put my girlfriend in the trunk and drove her off a bridge. I really think, I'm thinking as a 14 year old person that he did this. He's oh doing, no. This is affecting me. This is like, I can't show my parents this. This is like, it's like the holy grail of like you play it in like your basement because you hope your mom doesn't hear you listening to all the curses and stuff. Like it was like, Music was a different, you know what I mean. Yeah. You, get a oh, little, you get mildly jaded after a while because it becomes the hit chase or the stream chase or the this chase or the yeah, whatever. I think, I think mine was like smell, smells like Teen Spirit, which I know was a lot of people's. But just remembering my my mom and my sister being like, "This guy's yelling. This is terrible." Yeah. I'm like, "No, no this no, guy no, is the like, answer." Exactly. 100%. Like, because I was I was having to sing in choirs and choruses, and then you you're like, "Wait, you're allowed to sing like this? You can get angry because you, you can be angry." Yeah, and, yeah. and it's. For the record, he's exceptionally accurate, you know, with you know, pinpoint kind of intonation, and it's shocking. It's shocking to be able to do that. And those are like, well written records. Like and those are well written songs, quote unquote pop yeah. smashes. But yeah. they were just like cloaked yeah. in this yeah. thing. So you're watching some forty one. Yeah, just it, over over time, it just became like I want to make beats and I like rapping, but I also love like transatlanticism yeah. and I also love like oh this is like I just want to do everything and I can do everything you have that yeah. like young like I can do yeah. anything I want to do sure so I think high school started becoming an obsession I decided to go to a music school uh five towns college in Long Island instead of playing ball or going to you know like a SUNY school or something like that and then I went to college for about a year and during that time was like, I feel like that was really the 10,000 hours. Like, cause I went to school with a bunch of kids from like all the boroughs that like made beats beats that were like MPC heads. And that was all I hung out with. It was all, all just like, come to my dorm room and let's make beats for eight hours. And that was our video games. That was our right. whatever. And it was just that. It was the beat making process. So I'm recording them. They're coming to my dorm room. I'm kind of like the 
khaled of campus if you want to call it that <laughs> so it just so i'm really i'm recording vocals and i'm getting it's these 10,000 yeah. hours of practice without yeah. realizing that it's going to help me if i ever pub deal no i didn't even know what any of that was then i made a mixtape that like my friends made me put out in college i was passing it out out of plastic bags like in the hallway in college and this dude matt mashy like just graduated 2 years before me like right before i left college all right so i leave i left college to do music full time. My dad said if you get a full time job and work at the catering hall like six days a week, you can leave school. Wow. And I asked my father to whatever you were gonna invest in me for the the remaining three years of my college, whatever, can I take that investment as a business loan? And if I don't pay you back by the time I'm twenty two, I won't do music anymore and I will come to the family business and work it. So whatever you were gonna pay for college wow. for me, can I have that to, to pay what back? What was the family business? Uh, my dad has like a furniture transport company uh, that he's done. He came from nothing to like sure. something from like my dad yeah. was like pushing Mr. Softy trucks like when I wasn't born. And then by the time I was born, I was the fourth kid and things were kind of established in his furniture yeah. business, which I always could have leaned on. It just right. wasn't, it wasn't necessarily for me. Um, so basically I left school, got a job at the catering hall. That mixtape was put out. I was in a bad place, like six, seven months working, you know, catering hall jobs are rough because you're working until yeah. two in the morning. It's, it's just like a rough thing. And long story short, like at the end of my rope, I remember I got fired from the catering hall, like after working there for like a pretty good while. Why? I'm not, I don't even remember. I honestly don't even remember. It was like, I like messed up the scheduling or some, something to the effect where the, and like new management came in. I had the same boss for like ever. And then this new person came in that like changed everything. And they just were like trimming people off basically. Yeah. Three days after that, I get a phone call. <laughs> I wish I could make this up from Cara Guardi like out of my sleep, like out, like no connections to the outside music world. I mean, nothing like had no, no way of getting things you off the ground. You never sent your music out. I never. Anything. And my dad manages, managing me at this point. He has no, wife. my dad's like an Italian right. businessman from like New Hyde right. Park. Like it's like, or like Brooklyn or it's like, so he ends up, she ends up calling me out of my sleep three days after I get fired saying this kid, Matt Mashey, who graduated from your college, found yeah. your mixtape through a friend who still goes to your college. There's a, there's a guy who's leaf blowing right outside that window. But, um, and he's, he's leaf leaving. blowing your career into <laughs> Cara Diaguardi's ears. <laughs> she, she calls me, says, Matt Mashi brought your mixtape and he needed a job so badly at the label because he was interning at that point. Apparently, yeah. he brought my CD that I was handing out in plastic bags in college on her desk and said, if you don't sign this kid tomorrow, you can fire me. Like, if you don't want to sign this kid tomorrow, like, he, he was saying, I yeah. want an A&R job. So he put his job on the line for my Good stuff. For and he, him. But he never even told me he was doing this. This is all... And he I'm, was just one of the MPC heads from... No, he was just he, a dude who graduated, like, two years before me. I never a, even met him. He just heard the no mixtape and was like, this kid came from five towns? Like, whatever. And he thought... And so Dakara thought that it was a producer, a rapper, a writer, and a singer that were doing all of these things. Right, of course. But because I've just like all my buddies were doing, and I was recording people in high school, I was doing everything myself. We all still assume that about you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we so, all know and still assume that that's not the case. Uh, yeah. So yeah, and then yeah. she calls me and she's like, "Hey, we want to sign the producer. We want to give you guys a studio. We want to give you guys." every opportunity she kept saying you guys and I was like letting her talk because I was like didn't even know what to say yeah. and like at the end of the conversation she was like and the mixtape with like because there was it was like a ROM mixtape there was like 75 songs on it she was like and everybody that worked on it we want to give them all a deal so like you should come into New York tomorrow I'll get you a car and come to Warner because she was working at Warner at the time and I was like by the way like it's just me and then after that th I feel like things got so much faster like she was just like wait a second like you did this. You, you're the singer, the rapper, the producer, the writer. I was like, yeah, that like that's me. And then from that, all these different managers were calling, and all this like this whole thing started happening. My phone was ringing from people that I had no idea who it was, and it was just like a thing. And then she was like moved really fast because I feel like at that point there was a couple different managers that contacted me. Chris Lighty, rest in peace. He was um, like Jay Cole's management. A bunch of different people were kind of like in on what was going on. They heard the beats. They heard the song somehow. And things just moved, but I went with Kara because she was most passionate about it. There's also something about you know, um, I had a producer say early on, it's like there a lot of these people are different, but not necessarily better than each other. And the first person who comes in heavy and is like, I want to do this, and I'm going to 
because everyone's looking for, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? And if they're willing to say, I want this right now, then and they're the first, they're doing it without anybody else saying, like, oh, I want to do it too. Totally. They're just willing to do it. Yep. And Kara is amazing at that. Oh, she's on top she, of everything. So I mean, you know, that was that's the right move to go to the person that's that's not concerned about what the rest of the industry thinks so far. Totally. You know. Totally. And then, so during that, also during that time, I'm just trying to get everything off the ground. So then it hit me like, oh, Kara has. Wait, she sold her catalog for how much? Like, you could write records for other people, and like, whoa, that's a whole thing. So she asked me when I got to Warner that, like, literally that next day, I came in with my dad, played on the piano, like. She listened to all the records and she was like, what do you want? She was like, do you want an artist deal or do you want a publishing deal? And when I heard that she sold her catalog and like it was possible to like really do the whole Timberland Pharrell thing that I looked up to so much growing up, like this could be my in. I chose a publishing deal and I was like, maybe in the next year if I could just nail like a couple hits, that'll pay for my and what year was that? artist stuff. I, I don't even yeah. remember to be honest with you. To be, it was like... It's like 2011-ish? Yeah, 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 just about, I'd say. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, yo, if this works out, maybe I can get in the room with like my heroes and learn what they're doing and take certain things and how to make my records better for my artistry. So I was really just using my publishing deal to, to, to get better at my artistry. Like it wasn't even a thought of like, I'm gonna nail as many smashes as I can. It wasn't even on my like radar. It was like, oh, maybe I can get drums from like Danger Hands. Like maybe I can get in with so-and-so that I will, like this person who makes beats or this person who makes, and it was like, Fast forward, I, so I chose the publishing deal. You're 21, 22. 21, 22, just yeah. like, how do I, okay, like this is yeah. great. And she just sent me through a boot camp. Like yeah. I was doing six sessions, I moved out to LA. Like she got me, I stayed in her house for a while and all while simultaneously finding management for my artistry, who is Chris Zaru, who's also a logics manager and a bunch of different people at the time. Um, so as this is all growing, a couple of hits just like, kind of happen like just being in the room and just being like yeah like let's write I'll, I'll do whatever I can like I just don't want to go back to the catering hall I don't that's all in my head was just like don't go back to a nine to five like you have to impress everybody you're in the room with make friends with as many people as you can because I can't go back to the catering it was never like I need hits and I need money and I need it was just like the artistry has to work and the publishing has to work because I can't crumb tables anymore like I'm gonna go nuts if like if I have to keep like white glove servicing people and stuff. And even when you aim for you, people who have publishing deals, record deals, when you aim for a hit, you still don't know what it's like to have a hit until you have a hit. So yes. it, whether your your motivation is either I want a hit for, you know, some people who think it's for their ego or their bank account, they still don't understand what it means. And the res, there's actually a strange responsibility that comes Dude. with the minute that people look at you as the guy who was in the room. You were saying it in our session the other day. You said <laughs> you get yeah. to a point where if you have enough hits, people start being like, you know, it's your responsibility in the room to have a taste level and all this different stuff. Everyone and half the time you're he, like, yeah. "Dude, that idea wasn't that good. It's not. It doesn't." Yeah. Have to, like. They start assuming that when you sing, if you sing in a room of people who aren't at the level that you're at. Everything you sing is going to be good, the best. Well, I was before you even mentioned that the other day in the session. I found myself like, like anything that you're gonna say, like, like right now we're, if anybody's listening to this, we're in your your studio with like platinum, triple platinum, three million sold plaques all over the place right now. Like my respect level for you is so high that myself, like when I'm in sessions with you, like, can you say things? Like I'm like, you know what? <laughs> He's got so many hits and so many things that I'm like. He's probably right. Whether it's like, man, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up, though, it's, it's yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, I do remember there was a point. You know, this is your story, not mine. But I was right when I was starting out. I was writing with like um, Sean Kingston, okay, and Jr. and yeah. and those guys. And I would and those guys would drive up with um, in Bentleys. <laughs> And I had a a Honda Civic from <laughs> nineteen ninety nine with you know manual locks and <laughs> manual windows, and I was driving up, and it was before I could even get you know the level up car from that, which I love it. was another thing. But I had, I think I had something like less than ten thousand dollars total, and 
and there was a girl I was writing with who was getting a divorce and wanted to sell a gift that she got for her husband before they before he cheated on her. Oh my! And Lord. it was a a Louis Vuitton uh, bag, and I'd seen all these guys coming in with designer shit, and it was the first time where I did something totally that's just kind of out of character for me. And I was like, "How much for the Louis Vuitton bag?" She's like. <laughs> Uh, I'll sell it to you for a thousand bucks. I knew it was two thousand dollars, so I was like, "Well, in worst case, if I'm hungry, I can sell it." And I started showing up to sessions with a Louis Vuitton bag, and people started being like, "Oh, yeah, I, I could see, I could see people be like, oh, nice bag." And and you see a shift. And I'm not saying that people should spend their money on material things because in the end, if I didn't ever have any good ideas, it wouldn't matter. Bro, anyway. perception, artistry, but artistry it, is percep. Everything is perception. It it did it did affect. I could tell. I could totally. see how much it actually affected. Totally. You know the totally. people in the room that they started listening, thinking that oh, from writing, I was able to purchase those kinds of things. And as you get further, you start to be like. Either you get further into the that the world, flashiness the underbelly of, it, of like, or you start getting into like at least you know doing it in jest, or you're having fun with it. Yes. you know it's like because yes. you, you, it, it really is that sink or swim thing. So oh, you totally. can kind of show. I don't know. I don't know how I got off on. I love that, that. thing, but <laughs> um, all right. So you happen to write it. Uh, I guess monsters really yeah. kind of like. I mean, you had the, the mixtape, and you had but. There's no, no, no way. it wasn't even like nothing. There's nothing. There's no. nothing like no. And there's probably you know statistically speaking, those songs happen every three or four years anyway. Totally. It's not like those songs happen even every year. No. You know. So what was it like to have? Did you think that this was going to be easy to repeat? This monster, which is Eminem featuring Rihanna. You write it with BB. Yep. Our our friend of the podcast, yeah. BB Rexa. Yeah, yeah. And. It just blows up. Honest to God, it was just, I'm about to make mad money to dump into music videos. Like, I'm going to pay my dad back, like what he loaned me, and I'm going to put out some music videos, and now I can pay for them. And now my, what I'm going to sign for even bigger when these, because right around this time, I think I had one or two mixtapes out that were garnishing enough for me to tour 200, 300 cap rooms and sell them out. And we were doing that simultaneously while doing sessions and touring and sessions and touring. It's back yeah. and forth. And even when I was in LA doing sessions, I'd come home from sessions and work on the mixtapes by myself from what I learned in those sessions. I'd be like, oh, I saw Danger Hands do this, this, and this. I could do this on one of my records or whatever. So at that point, it just turned into like, okay, I wrote this song. I got off of a flight in France from a writing camp that we were in. I get off. I have 100 text messages. Funk Flex is dropping bombs on the record on Hot 97 in New York. I'm landing in New York. Like, it's all this stuff happening. But the only thing on my mind was like, another thing that I don't have to go back to the catering hall. Like if I could just keep getting these small wins and small things and, and branch out in as many different directions as I can and the artistry works and the publishing works, I don't have to go back to work again. Like I don't want to go back to work. I never want to go back to work. So it was never like, can I do this five more times? Can I do this three more times? Because honest to God, three months after the monster is when my next mixtape like took off on the internet in a way that was like, let's double the rooms. Let's go out. Let's go out. The session with you in the past month and a half is the first time in three years I've been writing for other people again. Yeah. I mean, I went, I had the number one record in the world, did a hundred percenter that went top 15 for Derulo, did a bunch of all these different records for other people and just went ghost. Like even Kara was just like, I can't fault you for just going with the artistry thing. But it was just, it consumed me because it took off and that was the most fun because I didn't have to write for anyone. I didn't have to, I could do whatever I want. If I want to rap, I'm going to rap. So it was more freeing and I didn't have to go back to catering all because I wrote the monster already. So I was like, let's just pay for this, for my lifestyle to just make whatever I want and do whatever I want. Well, and people don't realize that when you write a song like Trumpets, where you have the percentage of the song you have, (laughs) <laughs> I mean, that made me way more than the monster. Way more, and and everyone looks at they they look at charts all wrong. They think that so, number one songs mean that you get paid more, but you know, I mean, there's a song right now that's number one. Maybe it's in the, maybe it's not this week. Maybe it was last week, but you know, that has something like nine writers on it. And when you have nine writers, you know, you're. You're talking about whatever it is. Is that twelve point two eight percent? And then the artist comes in and demands thirty you know, off jump. The artist yeah. comes in and says, "I don't care how many writers are on this. I want thirty percent, or else sure. my platform's not going to take it to where you need the song to go." You know, it's it's great for leverage. It's not no money, it, but when you have, if you have, 
you know, fifty percent of a moderate hit. If you have seventy five percent of a of a top thirty, if you have a hundred percent of a top forty, you're making as much as you would on the yeah. one ninth. Oh, of it, a, it peaked at fourteen, yeah. but because I had a hundred percent of it, it yeah. that that was like well, worldwide. Yeah, it was. It was a bigger song worldwide. Plus, it got licensed like crazy. Like crazy. Yeah. I saw checks yeah. that I didn't even like. I was like, yeah. "What is this for? Like yeah. commercial in Germany? Like yeah. what? What is? What's going on right now?" So it was like, and the feel of it was so you totally because I'll tell you why. Right when that mixtape where I was telling you the monster happened, and then this yeah. mixtape popped off, right. and then the internet starts buzzing off of my stuff. I'm randomly in sessions all the time. Guys like Mike Karen or certain people are putting me in these sessions randomly while I'm working on my artist stuff, and then. At the end of the session, when everybody's smoking or drinking or hanging out or doing whatever, it's like, oh, I do artist stuff too. Oh, play me some stuff. And I played some stuff for Derulo one day because we just had a session. Like it was just like, and then he was like, yo, if you ever have anything, like, please send it to me. Two weeks later, I have this song called Symphony. It was Symphony at the time. And it was like, this is a little too pop for my album. And I don't know. I guess I've never pitched records to anybody before. So I just like hit Jason up. I was like, hey, you want to FaceTime real quick? I want to send you something. He called me back in my, dingy apartment up in the hills like he came to the apartment and recorded with a sock over the pop filter so again like it wasn't even like can i do this again like after the monster after i did it again it was like man if i could nail 100 percent on him i could pump even more money into my artistry i could pump i could still live in a crappy apartment and i could pay for that forever but i can just keep going with the artistry and this buys me more time to get better by myself and to get better on what i'm doing so that's really and then the artistry kind of took a place where it was like well, all this time is, low worked out. Well, this it, before we get to all time low, because yeah, I think yeah, yeah. this is the turning point, really, of you know at least the artist for This week's episode is sponsored by BMI. At BMI, music moves their world just like it moves mine. BMI is my performing rights organization. They're the bridge between people who create music like me and the businesses that bring it to the public. They make sure I get paid when my music is streamed on apps or shows, played on radio, at live shows, or in bars, gyms, basically anywhere where music is played. And they do this for over 900,000 songwriters, composers, and music publishers with more than 14 million songs across genres. But it's more than that. They help us navigate the music industry. They create opportunities for aspiring writers and composers through stages at festivals, song camps, and workshops. And they connect us with the right people. They're also on Capitol Hill fighting for copyright protection and fair royalties. And they work hard to ensure the future of music. They have my back and they'll have yours. Learn more at BMI.com. Today's podcast is brought to you by Banzoogle. From garage bands to Grammy winners, Banzoogle powers the websites for thousands of musicians around the world. Their simple step-by-step system will get you online in minutes. Choose from dozens of mobile-friendly templates, customize your design and content in just a few clicks. Built for musicians by musicians, Banzoogle has all the features you need for your website and EPK already built in, including a merchant download store to sell music and merch commission-free right on your website. Use your tour calendar to promote your shows and sell tickets commission-free. Mailing list tools to grow your fan list and send professional newsletters. Integrations to pull in content from all your online services, including Twitter, Instagram, and SoundCloud. And live support from their musician-friendly team seven days a week. Plans start at just $8.29 a month, which includes hosting and your own free custom domain name. Go to Banzoogle.com to start your 30-day free trial and be sure to use the promo code ATWI to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. That's Banzoogle.com. Use the promo code ATWI to build your website today. Go from I'm doing mixtapes. Everyone you know, started talking about you behind your back because <laughs> you know you were you were becoming an, a, you know a musical influencer. Totally. You know, um, every label in the world was coming after you. Yes. You got a deal that you 
dictated in a way, which is very oh, unique. Yes. And people, you know, when when you have a product that <laughs> labels want, that's when you get, you know, you get the deal that that you hear about. And some people go for money, money, money up front, and some people go for marketing and support, and some people go for percentage on the back end. Why did you choose capital? Two reasons, honestly. Most money up front because I just needed more money. I wanted to pay for more videos and do more things. And what's crazy is I wasn't even thinking. I was, I was at that time. I didn't realize it, but it's because of the generation I grew up in, which well, this is what labels really are. I was thinking them as a bank. I'm like, I just need to get them to loan me more money. I don't need a product manager. I've been doing this on my own forever. Me and my, me and Visionary Music Group have been getting this off the ground by ourselves forever. We just don't have the capital, so I just needed capital. So I'm approaching these companies by saying. Two things. I need the most capital more than anybody else that you can give me because I'm going to take that money and it's going to be my personal money and it's not going to be necessarily, I'm not like worrying about the recoupment. It's all monopoly money at this point in my head. I'm just like, if my career gets off, who doesn't cares matter. what they give me? Because if it doesn't work out, I have a big chunk of money to invest. And if it does work out, I'm going to get way more than what they're giving me. So it's just an investment. That's all it is. There's a thought process on the other side, essentially, that's like if you have a, you know, if, if if you're gonna go and you keep negotiating, negotiating, whatever, but it's no matter what, if if you're negotiating a deal and the the artist is a failure, then the the deal was a failure, and if the artist was a success, the exactly. deal was a success, and there's no amount of money one way or the other that's really <clears throat> going to sway that. Exactly. Uh-huh. So so I'm basically thinking in my head, what do I need to do to grow this the proper way without forcing myself to be shelved? So in the contract, I said, the only person I'm signing with is A, who gives me the most money, and B, who lets me put out three free, unsigned, can't announce that you are my label mixtapes. I need to put out three more. Because by that time, people will trust me enough to buy an iTunes record. And it won't, be, I won't have to worry about the radio. I won't, I'll have an organic fan base like the Deadheads or a Dave Matthews Band situation where I'm going to be selling records whether the... I don't even want to bank on radio. Radio is, so, radio is such a fickle, stupid, annoying white washed gated thing that we are all playing this role of the dice thing that I don't want to participate in any of this. And if I happen to get a hit on the back end of what I'm doing, because I can put 10,000 hours into my craft, maybe one will spill out of the bag and it'll go. And that's what happened with all time low. It's just like, this is, this just worked. And it was a cherry on top. I was selling out rooms bigger than artists that were had way more hits than me. But so the all time low was just like, great. I made more money. It was just a cherry on top of the whole situation. So when I'm putting out three free mixtapes, this is I shouldn't be saying this now in capital. We can joke about it now. I was just putting myself in a position where I strong armed the label so they couldn't shelf me. Because at that point, three th- if they agree yeah, to three free albums, you, you'll get big enough. That my they Twitter can. followers would be yeah. so huge. My impact will be so huge that they're going to have to keep pumping money into me while I'm putting out free content. And if they're a million dollars in the hole, two million dollars in the hole, three million dollars hole with John Billion, they're going to make sure they make their investment back and they make sure John John Billion works. They're not going to scratch that off on the loss column. So I have to put them in such a position. To where they've sunk so much into me that if this doesn't work, it will literally be detrimental to their yearly gains. Right. So that's why I didn't tell them that at the time, but I was just like, I want to put out three free albums because we're in the content age and people need to trust you before they spend five ninety nine on an album. But really, in the back I mean, of my head, I'm like, they, I'm gonna did they fight you headlock on that? them. They didn't fight you on that. I they, mean, they they, they, they get me. it too on some level. They, they were did, willing to do it. I think because yeah. the number these labels don't care about your talent. They care about what you're garnishing and what you're bringing in. And my trajectory and my numbers and my schematics were saying. He's yeah. going places, so let's just listen to him. Did they believe me? Did they this? Everything was a fight with my label. They told me the human condition artwork was going to be stupid because I was likening myself to Disney, and that was too risky, and people weren't going to get it. I was going to lose my career. They said All Time Low wasn't going to even break top 40 because it was too weird and bouncy, and this, and, th- and they were wrong around a lot of turns. So at this point, by the time we get to Glory Sound Prep, they're very hands-off now. They're very let, like, let you do Let's let go do back to do. the mixtapes because the amount of work it takes <clears throat> to do a mixtape, it's easy to say, ah, three mixtapes. Three mixtapes, like, no wonder why you don't have time to go and do other sessions oh, at this yeah, point. Oh, yeah, it consumes everything. It, yeah, I mean, there's... And the long game is actually, if they let me do three mixtapes, then... So the difference was how many between songs me, per mixtape? Probably 13, 12 songs per mixtape. So at that point, and there's all original Aren't music. Aren't you tired? I mean, to the, now the new stage of my career now is just remaining passionate about no, my gifts. No, no. I mean, I'm, I'm t- I mean I'm when you're in the general. middle of saying, I'm going to go do three mixtapes, yeah. it's a good idea on the it first w- five songs. <laughs> and then on song six, you're like, I'm not even halfway done with the first yeah. mixtape. Yeah. It's not a and good idea. And doing it alone and, doing it yeah. with, and trying I mean, to top yourself and get better as you're 
being by yourself. And were you ever, did you ever feel emotionally any pressure? I think later like, on, I think oh, later no. on, we'll get into that. Like okay. th- that stuff starts to take a, a time and a place and a whole thing in your mind. But at that point, yeah. I was on such a, I'm going to be great. I'm not going back to the catering hall. And damn, this last mixtape did 22,000 downloads, which means, and my management's telling me the next one's going to do 44,000. So it was just exciting because yeah. I wasn't like, Famous. It was all underground. There was no pressure. No, nobody was like anticipating John Bellion's next installment, and some like hoity-toity music reviewer is gonna like weigh in on like why it's good or bad. Like no one cared about me. Just just random kids from all over the country that were coming to these shows. We were doing sheds for two hundred people in Utah. Kids ripping the punching holes through the windows in these places, and we're, we're moshing, going nuts because it was this like underground thing. So it was just exciting at that point. And then I'm thinking. All my rap friends that put out these mixtapes and sign these deals can't cash in on their music because it's all sampled. I didn't sample a thing. I made 100% of the music myself. Nothing is sampled at all. So then I put in my contract with Capital. Also, if you sign me, you have to sell my three mixtapes that are free later on down the road as a bundle thing. And I get 100% of the publishing just to cash in on it like The weekend did the trilogy. Uh-huh. But except I get 100% of the publishing. So if, even if we pump... A few of those albums, I'm still gonna make yeah. a substantial amount of money. So these are the things I put and in nine point one song per nine point one cents per song per album <laughs> times thirty nine thirteen songs per each. You know, you don't have to sell all that much to start making money. And the bigger yeah. my artistry gets down in the present yeah. time, now people Plus, don't again, listen if you to get one li- one license out of the forty songs you just release on these mixtapes, exactly. and it's like a, exactly. it's like a stupid, you know. Totally. So I was just yeah. putting these little seeds or these things around that just made sure I didn't go back to the catering hall. Like even to this day, for some reason, it's like an ingrained. I can never have a boss ever again. I can never be doing, and I'm not discrediting people's work. If, sure. if you if you work in a catering hall and that's what you do for a living, that's not yeah. that's not a bad thing. For me and my brain and my creativeness and what I have to let loose and whatever, I need to be my own boss. And I need, to, but that's just me though. Is that the same drive that makes you want to write a hundred percent of everything? I mean, we'll get into collaborating later because you're a good it was collaborator. Just, but it, it was never like I was never fully conscious of like I'm doing everything. Like everybody kept using that as that actually ended up being something that hurt me later on down the road because it was this thing where people kept building me up and throwing that in in conversation where when I was young, it wasn't that. It was just, Wait, my sister's would, not home. Hurt? Why would that hurt? Because this is going to be a whole tangent about my last album, Glory Sound Prep, and like this whole thing. But like, you can become a slave to the purest thing. Like, because you're doing 100 percenters of everything, people's like, there was this, there's this thing online that's like, I like the song, but once I saw him do 100% of it, I respected the record. So then it's like this cheat code yeah. where like, I could put out anything I want, and as long as people see me playing the bass and playing the things, and playing the, yeah. then they're like, John Bellion's a genius. And I'm like, I don't give a crap like who made it. I could have worked on it with 10 people. I want you to like the song because you like the song. So then I'm thinking, I can't use this as my crutch. So this last album was like, I'm bringing in people and working with other instrument players and other people because... Whether people want to admit it, my fans want to admit it or not, John Bellion has a sound. If you listen to the human condition and the definition or whatever, it's a sound. Just like Kanye, all the way through the chipmunk sample up until graduation, had to break a mold with 808s and heartbreaks to say, I don't want to be playing this in clubs in Las Vegas when I'm 40. Because there's a time and a place where it's futuristic, and then there's a time and a place where I start to hear a bunch of other artists right now who's, who do what I used to do very well. That I'm like, why would I regurgitate and do do the same thing again? So sure. when I was doing 100 percenters, it was like, yes, it was great financially. Yes, it was good. This is that third, but I didn't want to be like limiting myself because I have to do it all by myself. Did you find that your songs would start sounding the same? But because it's for, of I'm this. one person. It's formulaic. I, I work on the drums and I do this and that, and then you start to hear these patterns where the fans don't know what they want until 10 years after they get it. And that's factual, that, that's time and space as far as sonics goes is not relevant until you have history's lens to scope where it was in that moment. Right. I'm living with my music every day. By the time I made the human condition, I'm saying this is already spent. This is old. I have to tour this for two years. Yeah. People are going to be birthed from this album and young kids are going to hear this and be influenced by it. Timberland had a sound, but Timberland is my favorite, one of my top three favorite producers of all time. It still got dated. It's still the Timberland thing became dated. He's not doing that anymore, and he's and he's done a very good job of getting away from that. 
artists have to get ahead of themselves in that, in that form. So if we're talking about history or scope or sonics or whatever, I can't keep doing the funny noise, jumpy beatbox, groove, dilla thing that everybody knows me for. And if you, if you, if you go to the gym every day, and you see this dude in the gym that shoots and dribbles with his right hand really well. And you tell your friend about it. And then you, you guys both say, yo, he dribbles with his right hand. Come watch this. Come check this out. He dribbles with his right hand. So crazy. The basketball player knows yeah. in the scope of history, I got to right. get good with my left hand right. in order to be better yeah. as, a, as a longevity musician. A lot <laughs> of my fans, I think. So funny. That's right. A yeah. lot of my fans were coming to this next album, Glory Sound Prep, to say, look how good he dribbles with his right hand. This is what he does so well. And are we re we're so ready for this. I had my first kiss to this. I grew up with this album. He's been gone for two years. It's, it's been woven into the fabric of their everyday lives. So when I'm coming in off the jump with a, a record like Conversations with My Wife that has no drums, weird sloppy inverted year 3000 drums on the end of the song that is not what i usually do of course i'm anticipating fans who love low 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 a million times and the jumpy whoop, noises and things like that of course they're gonna be this isn't what i'm used to i'm rejecting this like when i was 15 and heard 808s and heartbreaks i was like i hate this i hate this i want a graduation again why didn't you give me graduation again but now the only thing I return to is 808s and Heartbreaks. It's been 10 years. And I find myself going back to 808s and Heartbreaks to say, well, this was such a refreshing album within the context of what he did. I couldn't find that out until History's Lens was put through. So was, I just went on a crazy tangent. But as far as like history and times and whatever, the 100 percenters were great. And I'm happy that I was doing 100%. And I still might do 100% on my next album on songs that yeah. they sound great, but I need to get better with my left hand. I yeah. need to do horn arrangements with Quincy Jones. I need to start rapping <laughs> with the RZA, rapping with Rock Marciano because it's, it's about the lineage and history scope. I could keep, yes, could I regurgitate myself, get more streams, get known for the thing. And then this whole thing comes up online where everything John Billion makes sounds the same. No, I'm going to get ahead of that, take the brunt of the hit now, lose 15% of my fans that like me because they saw me at the Jingle Ball where I did All Time Low a million times and do a six-minute rap mixtape just to break that mold to where now if I put out a rap mixtape, you're not surprised by it. But I have to make these decisions as an artist now in order to open myself up later down the line to stay passionate about what I love to do. I'm not passionate about being alone. I've worked my whole life to be alone to, to not be alone in the studio. I made a song called Luxury where I'm chopping up a trumpet on an MPC where I had to pay the guy to come to the studio and lay down one trumpet. This album, I'm doing 20-piece horn arrangements with Quincy Jones, performed by members of The Roots, The Dap Kings, and the violinist from Snarky Puppy. That's musical development to me. But is Susie, 14-year-old Susie from Arkansas, is she going to appreciate that when she's expecting lo 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 I don't know. And if, is that going to stream? Is that going to... No, but I know for a fact any artist who wants to crack his mold or is sick of what he's in or wants to try singing opposed to rapping or wants to try rapping opposed to singing, I could be the, I could be the guy to like snap it and break it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the artists we love most, the Becks of the world mm -hmm. and the Radioheads and the Kanye's, and they, they were, they're constantly pushing the envelope and we're constantly being like, well, it's not as good as their last one until we listen to it three times. We're like, man, that was better than the last one. <laughs> exactly. We're all we we are all at fault for I had not being open minded. Music reviewers in the human condition were saying, Who does this guy think he is? This is all over the place. He's trying to accomplish too much. I'm not yeah. now that Glory Sound Prep dropped, those same reviewers, the twenty four hour like hype machine, corny, whatever, yeah. like the crumb snatchers that wait for products from actual artists to drop to the bottom of the table and then and then <laughs> eat and then go tell people about it instead of people just go really listening to the so original funny. food. Um it's like they were saying originally when the human condition dropped, <laughs> this is all over the place. I don't like this. Da, 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 da. The same reviewer did a review for Glory Sound Prep and said, you know, over the, over the two years that he's waited to put out music, these songs have aged very well. And a couple of them have made it into my playlist, but Glory Sound Prep sucks. This one is really bad. It's the same thing you said on the last one. So yeah. I, I, you have to rest. That's why I think Kanye is frustrated all the time. That's why I think sure. writers, people are, because they exist in a time frame where like artists are always two years ahead of their fan base. They're always going to remain two years ahead of their fan base. And the fan base is always going to have to adjust to their palate. And if I could garnish a pop fan base or a niche organic underground fan base at the same time, because I feel like I'm in this weird middle ground of that, it's my responsibility to, to show, to expand their palate as an artist. Some artists don't want to do that, and that's okay. And I'm not saying that I'm the most pure out of everybody. I'm just saying I feel a thing in my spirit to 
expand the palate of somebody who might not even realize they want their palate expanded. Because that's, that's what a lot of the great artists do. The Frank Oceans of the world, the Led Zeppelins of the world. Sgt. Pepper's Out the Gate was skewed. The album was crucified. Everybody hated the album. That was the biggest influencer for me on Glory Sound Prep. It's history scope. It's like you can only, you can only judge things once they've lived in the climate that they're existing in from an artistic perspective. Sometimes people, yeah, in the product world, people need products that apply to the, the, the product now and people need them because you need to sell those products. Art is like, you're comparing it within the catacombs of history and, and all of the influences that you're brought, but then you're also trying to present something new, but you're drawing from the things that have influenced you. And then you're also worried about the scope of time. It's too early. And trying to ju- it's too early it's too is everything. Early. Yeah, Everything's too exactly. early. It's, it, it's the first draft of history. You read those, yes, you read, you yes. read cr- critiques, you, read, you watch 24-hour news cycles. It's just a first draft. We, you know, every, how many times are we having people rewrite, like, ah, we made that mistake, we made that mistake. The whole news cycle right now is, totally, is, totally. You know, is balancing Bro, that. Bro, 21 Pilots, let's say. When 21 Pilots were first exploding, all these snobby... You know, he's doing his best impression of, of All American Rejects on this one, and now he's doing his best impression of Stained on this record. Yeah. Like, he's just all over the place. No, that's, it's, it's just, just like the NBA. Yeah. LeBron James, if Jerry West from the 1940s played LeBron James in one-on-one, this would be a massacre. That doesn't mean Jerry West wasn't good. It's just where the climate goes. So now these bunch of freak kids who I was on the, like, I don't want to say the forefront, but I was one of the first kids that were, like, freak weirdos that were doing 100 percenters out of just sheer technology and necessity. Back in the 70s, you couldn't have 100 percenters because you couldn't get in the studio to, to, do, it, to do it to tape. You needed to get right. somebody to do it. Now you sit in front of a laptop. Like, I, just, I barely do my, I do my music in big studios simply because it's inspiring. I'm not doing it because of the equipment. I could do that out of a laptop. So out of necessity, these talented, incredible artists are drawing from larger scopes and accomplishing more musically because they just have to, to keep people's attention. You have to amalgamate different things. And 21 Pilots did that amazing. They were getting flack for it on the album that blew up because, oh, they're doing a bunch of different rock bands. They're just a big karaoke thing. No, that's what they've accomplished and what they've garnished and what they've done is because of, you're a genius freak product, Tyler and Josh, they're genius freak products of the generation that they came up in. And that's, I don't even know how I got down no, this no, road. But I get I was, so passionate no, about it. Here's, here's one of the things that I'm, I, I'm, I'm releasing music in a, in a few months. No, I can't and wait. I'm, and I'm a little bit nervous about the idea of people having an opinion when part of the point of releasing music is like a soul searching, I want to I wanna tell this story. Oh and it's, I mean, the whole purpose is just to entertain you people who get it Yep. And you people who love it, who will spend the time to actually yep. pay attention. It's because if you listen to any of your music and you spend one listen, two listens, and the more you listen to it, the more you're like embedded in it, you feel the artist, you get closer to you. And and people always talked about art as being brave. And when you're a writer, I can be really brave because I'm not the one Someone who has to go out. To sell it. I don't, yeah, yeah. so I can go as brave as I want, <laughs> and I can be as stupid as I want, or cheesy if yep. I want, or I can be deep and whatever I want to do. It's fine. It doesn't matter. Yes, it's a whole other thing when you're constantly putting music out for others to critique you as a person rather than you as a musician. My dad. And that drives me, that bro, scares me more bro, than anything. My dad said the other day, my, my parents, we were having a conversation and we were like, I was like, I think it's time. The album's been out for a while. I think I'm going to do some press about it. I'm going to talk about Glory Sound Prep. I'll, I'll do it because I want to stay away from it. Let it sit, let it simmer, let it whatever before I start to do it. My dad goes, you know, just treat it, just treat it like a business. You know, you're, you're, you're selling your product. You're out there doing what you got to do. I said, Dad, the difference between, like, okay, if I'm selling a product, which we're all doing in the music industry or whatever, if I sell a rocking chair and the rocking chair fails, people say, I hated that rocking chair. They don't say, I hate the maker of the rocking chair. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so you, you can put it into this product and you yeah. say, think what you want about it because it's not a represent. It is a reputation to me and it hurts and I wish it sold more, but no, people aren't saying, I, I hated the Bill Belly and rocking chair. I was saying to my dad, and he, uh, he started to digress. And then I said, "Now imagine, <laughs> instead so, of just yeah. instead of just get it, just showing people, hey, look at the rocking chair. Do you like it or do you not?" Us as artists, bravery is a great word because you're not just going check out my product. I think it's great. You're going 
These are my views, my thoughts, my opinions on on faith, on spirituality, on what I think life is about. This is my heart. I'm vulnerable to you. And you're going into the middle of town square and I'm singing, what if who I hope to be was always me and the love I fought to feel was always free? What if all the things I've done were just attempts at earning love because the hole inside my heart is stupid deep? And there's one Joe Schmo in the back going, fuck this guy, I don't like this shit. <laughs> and it took me everything in the studio to like, I'm weeping with tears down my eyes and letting it go. So people wonder why artists are like, Artists are the most contradictory people on the planet. And this is why. We live in an age where you have to make people believe that you don't give a shit what they think about you in order for them to like you and sell records. So artists make no sense. Like for me to go on a pulpit and say, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I do my own shit. I do me. I'm the realist all the time. And if you don't like that, go fuck yourself. But also I need you to buy my album and come to my shows because if I don't, I'm not going to have a career. So deep down, you need people to love you and accept you. And deep down, that's what we're all really doing. Just we don't want to, we don't want to admit that. So as a writer, like you said, it's easy to, and that's why. So why are you I, an artist? That's, I'm constantly towing this line. And I had this conversation, I have it with, I have it with my wife. I have it with my, my mom, my dad, my sisters, and people around me. I'm towing this line of like, I'm constantly upset that people are drawing inspiration from me, but I don't want to be famous. So I don't, when I get the offers to do the Saturday Night Lives or the different things and I'm like, I'm good. And management's like, so frustrated. And then I get frustrated when people aren't recognizing that this is going to be good in 10 years. Like, so what do I want? I don't know. Because I think it's me figuring out as I get older, what's important to me. I thought hits and streams and fame and the older I got, it became like, I just love the gifts that God gave me. I love making music because I love to create. And then it hit me. If I keep following that, is that going to help me with streams? If I don't post, like, I don't want to post on my social media, but do I want the world to hear my music? Yes, but I don't, I can't be a slave to the content beast because it makes me unhappy. Why am I an artist? I don't know. Why do I get a slave the to the content beast is <laughs> so real. Are, all these artists today have to be, we have to be like, we're selling ourselves in this highlight reel of life. That is social media. That's, you can't keep up with that forever. It's, no, I'd rather, some point I'd just, rather unsubscribe yeah. now and yeah. whatever the repercussions come from that with my music. The, the, the perfect it's world It's not like for you me, see Tom Waits on, on social media all the time <laughs> being like, check out this meal. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like, you have to find yeah. a way. I see young artists and now and whatever that I'm realizing it's not just about, I thought I could drop Glory Sound Prep and people would realize like the all-time low guy is doing string arrangements for Rock Marciano now. I thought that would just click. But I realize if you're selling a product, you have to you stand have to, next to it and go, "Sir, the rock chair." You have to educate chair. it. Yeah. Do, have you ever? Yeah. Do you get back pain when you yes. sit down? Da, 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 da. Yes. Which makes me then have to find a balance between: Do I go? I love Russ. Do I go 100 percent Russ and just be like, "Ain't nobody fucking with me," and that's gonna make people go sell my album? Do I have to be funny on social media? Do I have to take pictures with the right influencers to do the right things for people to hear it? Or do I really rest in the fact that I believe I've made a great product? And the uneducated opinion of someone who's not really into music or doesn't understand Sonics is going to be like, oh, he disappeared. He fell off. He had one hit. And I mean, because I'm realizing Tory Lane said it in an interview that was really cool. He was like, I'm just going to keep doing this and this and this and this. Some people do this with a hit and then they uh, social media and they do all these. My fan base, I sold more tickets this time, time around than I did on the human condition. I, I did more streams first week this time around than I did the human condition. And as long as every album slowly but surely does this, I'd rather have a Dave Matthews band, Grateful Dead fan base when I'm 60 years old and I can tour whenever I want opposed to starting a beef with somebody to garnish attention for the streams. And it's just, it's just not my style. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing for people to do. It's just not for me. So should Glory we, Sound Prep is we this, have a beef? <laughs> start, start arguing <laughs> and fighting. Yeah, this is the, you have such a healthy ego. <laughs> that, that conversation that we're having. <laughs> yeah, what is, is Why are you so nice? <laughs> You're nicer. <laughs> it's like the worst beef of all time. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, why be an artist? I think. Let's set a trend of nice beef. A nice beef. Yeah, Dude, just I nice beef around the in, how industry. Nice. <laughs> we're just like, man, you are so nice. <laughs> Dude, in the you writer the room, I don't, this is for this is a podcast. Yeah, sure. and the writer is. It is just a giant competition to see who could just be the most. Nah, like, dude, you got the right, number one record on Billboard. No, nah, dude. Nah, I need as many nah. as you, bro. It's yeah. like I'm trying to be like you. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, so real. This is the community. That's the writer community. But yeah, sorry. Yeah, you were. Yeah. 
As no, far as as far yeah. as Glory Sound Prep in this album, and I guess I wanted to, to do things like this in podcasts and whatever to have to freely speak about it is because I'm, this my journey, my musical journey, the, this album is not 120 characters. It's not. It's not. It's gonna. It's gonna. I need you to listen to it nine, ten times. Like some of my favorite albums that I didn't like off the jump and whatever. And I'm saying it as if the album wasn't successful. That's not the case. My fan base are static and they're related and whatever. But there is the twenty percenters or the thirty percenters in the fan base that are just confused and don't. Where's the John Bellion thing? They keep, I keep hearing that. Where's the John Bellion thing? Where's you could have had ten more hits doing a, more all time lows like a, a mustard and just keep pushing the sound. Like why didn't you just keep doing your sound? If I'm rich, famous, and sh- number one streamer in the world and miserable because I'm regurgitating myself, or I would, okay, I would rather feed 25 people than entertain 100. Wow. I would rush, if, if you hear Stupid Deep or you hear the last verse in Adult Swim or the internet or whatever, these are concepts that will age like wine over time and it will feed a person who needs that at the moment. Is that me banging my chest saying, I get bitches and I'm the greatest and I could do this. this, this. No, that's not it. But, and is that, is that in today's day and feed the content beast age, is that what's going to get immediate clicks? Because it's not controversial. It's not, but there's a truth there. And the truth is going to last way longer than the entertainment of it all. And that's another thing. Why be an artist? I'd rather be, I'm, I'm realizing in my older age that I'd much rather be an artist than an entertainer. Enter- entertainment is, what is entertainment? You're you're a, you're a you're a you're a thing. You're you're just a thing that people talk about that don't know you, that don't whatever. If you come to my house, I don't want to entertain you. I want to feed you, and that's my spirit. That's my quest. That's what I. Th- I'm not saying that entertainers are wrong, and I'm not saying that people that want to be famous that have social media are incorrect. I'm just saying for me and my spirit and my balance and my health within the real world and family relationships and being tethered to actual reality. I'd rather feed less people and really feed them and give them something to walk away with that will feed them spiritually, musically, than entertain them for a short moment. Because right now, all we're doing is just fighting for entertainment. How can we get in front of as many people as we can? How many hits? How many this? Can we garnish with this? There's a part of me that's okay with accepting. The f- they'll say that I fell off, and it's all right. I'm okay with Do you accepting think you're gonna, that. I mean, uh, all time lows, obviously, like it's it, it's. Uh, Multi platinum song, yeah, is out of control. Yeah, first of all, <laughs> um, second of all, it's it is a weird thing, you know, the idea that people expect you to follow up success rather than art. Totally, those are different things. And and if you look at this and it's, is the and thing it's different with, for different people. If right, so some people's version of success is doubling the streams and becoming more famous, and, and that's okay. But, like, but when we talk about, I always use Picasso as yeah. the example where he has six phases of his career. When he does cubism, he spends years working on this style. You know, he didn't deviate from that style. That was his collection of records of mm. that time. Mm. And then he would go and do something totally different. And he would do, you know, whatever. He'd have a bunch of characters with fat fingers. And all of a sudden it was rounded. It went yeah. from like really geometrical to really rounded. And then went full into that. But no one was like, hey, why don't, I mean, maybe they were. Maybe they wanted him to do, why don't you continue on with this yeah. genre? Yeah. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> those great artists visually, and it's sometimes easier to show people people visually that the great artists some of them did the Elvis Costello thing like like a Monet where it was like that was the thing and he stuck to it or you know and you you respect that for what it is and some people did the Picasso thing and that's like the Radiohead thing totally. and, and it was like, or the Beatles you know and they Bro. every single album was different and not you know you look back on you know I think Yellow Submarine is the biggest song on Yellow Submarine. That's not really the album we all look for. No. But no one looks at the Beatles and thinks, man, they're not the greatest band of all time because <laughs> yes, they released exactly. Exactly. Yellow Submarine. Instead, you're, you look back and you're like, oh, that was a fun phase. That was a thing. And it's you it's know, like a it's big just movie. A moment. It's a big yes, it's only in It's only in, in history that you can look back and say, that was Yellow Submarine. That wasn't the, and the White w- Album. What's crazy is, too, is finding the balance between the way me and you were talking, we're creators. So everything that we see, you look at a guitar, and as a creator, when you're sculpting pre-choruses and creating choruses and verses and things like that, me and you could look at a guitar from a geometric standpoint and say, what a beautiful bodied, shaped, colored guitar. Wow, what if 
me and you are artists because we care about that. I'm realizing in my older age too that there's really no such thing as like <laughs> as better art than something else because certain people just don't care. Half the people that me and you sell records to do not care about the impact of Sgt. Pepper and 808s and Heartbreaks and da-da-da-da on the scope of history. So at the end of the day, what can you do? You can remain passionate and balanced and happy about the art that you're creating. And whatever comes from that, at least you can live and die from you being passionate and happy in what you're doing. It's like, I'm just from the perspective of that's how I think. I think about the Sgt. Peppers. I think about the Picassos. I think about things like that. That inspires me. And I could talk I don't even want to leave it. I have a session today. I don't even want to go because this yeah, is no, like I'm, I'm in it. This is my thing. <laughs> this is my this is what I love to talk about. But uh. so how can I blame somebody? I can't be this angry artist on a platform that's like I'm taking it to the next level. And stupid deep is a ballad from the year three thousand with an anti dance drop, and it's this, and it's it's got four it's got four stands it's got four stanzas with the same two stanzas all the way through. No one's doing that. Or just see where the chips fall yeah. and whatever, because it will drive you. Bananas. There's yeah. this thing in me that goes, should I just should I just go to like a Starbucks, knock over coffee, scream my album's the best, get it on camera, and make sure it goes viral, and that'll make people click on it? Do I have to start being somebody I'm not by screaming, I'm the greatest living, blah, 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 blah. I'm not cut out for that life. I don't want that type of attention. Am I trying to do that through my music? Yes. So I guess history is the only... Let's have another podcast in 10 years and let's see where oh, things yeah. have settled. Let's, Absolutely. Let's, if I'm on certain records, that's like the right whole now, point. Is like, this is, this is supposed, I mean, we talked about it the other day, but as far as I'm concerned, if this, if the podcast is, the whole purpose of it is to do a snapshot of our generation so of writers, so genius. just to be like, here's some proof that we existed and then here were the people because, you know, there are a few documentaries about, the Brill Building and Motown and whatnot, but we're all talking to them now about what it was like then, rather it, than talking to them then about totally. what it was like then. And I would, I, I hope that that's you know the moment, a hundred percent. You know, well, I this is a personal question, but do you have a therapist? Like, how do you do you read philosophy? Where because you have a really well adjusted, <laughs> um. Mature point of view. Is it just from experience? Is it your wife? Is it your parents? Like, where do you learn? I feel like the crazy part is, I feel like I'm not adjusted. I'm still balancing. Like you said, then why even be an artist? It's like some days where I wake up, I'm like, I don't know. Like, it is nice to to have cuts with your friends and go to Jamaica t- to the BMG writing camp experience and eat nice food and have a chef and make some records. And if they don't work, no one cares. Like no one's going right. on social media comment thread being like, what if this yeah. is crazy? He fell off. Da, da, da. Yeah. So there's days where I, I tell them, people in my family or whatever, there's days where I'm like, yeah, I think I'm done. Everybody's like, yeah, okay. And I'll see you in four days in your studio, head going crazy. Like this is the future. This is, I, it's, what we try to do and why I think artists are depressed and rest in peace with all most respect, Mac, the Mac Millers, the Jimi Hendrixes of the world, the certain people, we're, try, we're connecting to the divine and music is like you're literally trying to figure out the divine. So every day you're trying to touch a piece of lightning and every day you grab it and you, the first time you feel it, your eyes get wide and you go, oh my God, this was divine. I got this pre-hook or this chorus that just <laughs> washed over my body. Then you do it again, but it's not as much. It's like it's like meth. Yeah. And you grab it again, you have a number one. And then, oh, that feels crazy. Oh, I need this, and I need this, and it never ends. Artists become... We were not designed... Uh, okay, this is, this, misplaced glory is a death sentence. If you, if you have all this thing put on your shoulders to say, it came from me, and that's where, like, in, like, the Greek, like, whatever, they used to say, like, what a genius was. And a genius was actually, like, a spirit that visited you. And now throughout, like, I guess, American culture, whatever, we've taken it that I'm the genius and it comes from me. Yeah, it became an ego, right? Yeah, 100%. And, so, and a divine. Right? 100%. Right. So now it's, there's this, like, being contradictory where you have to put out, promote this thing where it's like, I don't care what anyone thinks about me ever. And I'm like, I just do my art and I do what I do. And if you don't like that, then go F yourself and da-da-da-da. And then you ask for it. You, you make people not like you because you, I don't care what you think about me. I don't need you. I don't need your acceptance. Then they don't buy the album. And then you're caught in your own ego and you're caught in what you've said in interviews and then you can't break out of the caricature of yourself. So then you have to be like, all right, now how do I get people to buy my album now that no, one, no one's buying my album anymore? Where do I get this stuff from? It's just me forecasting like, 
oh, I can't be doing the it's same just, music. It's nice I can't it, be. to have self-awareness as any writer artist is super unusual. A lot of us are wading through this unusual industry and art form. You know, because well, people the don't love people don't love. This is gonna. This is where things get controversial. People in the industry don't love you. We, they don't love you. The label doesn't care about you. So why the hell was I found myself at the Capitol party? Like, what am I doing here? If my shit doesn't doesn't go next year, none of these people want to even know my name. They don't even want me in the building. So why am I investing? But then you say there's balance. So yes. They are my factory. They are the machine. I make the Coca Cola. They make the bottle. They have to. They have to do it. So I have to remain that relationship. Great, but it, like you said, is finding out where am I getting my love from? Am I drawing it from the right places? And if I'm getting the love from the right places, how will this affect me in ten years? And that's just what I'm constantly thinking about. If I'm constantly and drawing from streams or popularity or social media or whatever, and that's giving me the love that I need, when that goes away, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be in a rough. A rough spot. But if nowhere, it's crazy that the most intangible things and the things that don't get you respect and don't get you popularity are the things that are going to feed you the most. A, a great home life, a great family life. Yeah. Being, and that's not, I'm not saying I'm such a good husband. I'm saying working on your marriage or working on your relationship yeah. or your relationship with your family, that's going to give you longevity and years of happiness and balance. I was with, that's not going to get you clicks. That's not going to totally. get you. And sometimes when you drop, I, I, well, sorry, because no I'm one will so remember much. any of us when we're when we're seventy. Like none, like maybe some people, but the kids now don't know Paul McCartney. They're probably not going to know us. And and when you look at like, um, you know, I was talking to someone. I was talking to Keith Urban, and we were in a session, and he's Facetiming with his wife and kids, and all he does is care about his family. And you're talking about, I know his, his wife is very famous and very successful, but he's like constantly working and he, he doesn't deviate from being a good husband. And it's just like, if your home life just is terrible, happier. if your home life is terrible, you can't, it, st- it goes out Water, into the workforce, yeah. it goes out into whatever, that'll yes. affect you all the way through. Yes. And it, like you said, the family life or whatever, I'm realizing as I get older, I would rather make a song that a father feels good passing down to his son because it's feeding his son opposed to something that entertains a young man who might not have his priorities or his things straight. White Snake was cool at one point. Let's not forget that. Let's not get caught up in like clicks and clicks and things and who's beefing with who. White Snake was cool at one point. <laughs> Twisted Sister was cool at one yeah. point. Let's relax. Not yeah. everything is, he's the goat. He's the greatest. He's the this, he's that. It takes 20 years for that to happen. At a certain point, somebody was like, I'm going to the Twisted Sister concert because this is the future and this is going to be forever. And then you got crabs at a, at a Twisted Sister concert <laughs> and you look back on a time in your life where like, whoa, I had teased hair in the 80s and this was wild. Like, let's relax. Like, Time is yeah. going to time it's is going to wash away a lot of things. It's gonna it's gonna scrub around, and when the stones of wisdom, the stones of truth, and all those things, the truth is the only thing that's gonna end up whatever. And that's not me pumping myself up saying I'm the truth, I'm this, I'm the, no no no. I'm just saying in general, just remember. I'm not gonna name any artists. I'm not gonna say anything. But just remember, like at one point, I thought thirty inch spinning rims on a Cadillac was success. Like like that was cool to me. TVs in the headrest. Like big Mitchell and Ness jerseys, as like a white kid from the suburbs seeing like Ja Rule, like I thought that was cool. Like South Pole, South Pole velour jerseys were cool at one point. Let's not get too excited it right now. It will evolve, and will evolve. Yeah, and we're at the yeah. most product consumption peak of existence ever. Nothing is the greatest of all time yet because time has not been timed. With right. this, we can't start throwing around goat. We can't start throwing around any of these things. Yeah, the, the songs that that we all talk about. Half of them didn't even crack the top twenty Dude, the top, or no. top ten. Bro, you know? like, like, bro. And, and people just assume that. Oh, but you know, I always think it's great that that Bruce Springsteen never had a number one song on radio. Phenomenal, That's the greatest Phenomenal. stat of all time. The ever. only song he ever had a number, uh, the only number one song he had was the Manfred Mann's cover. Manfred Mann cover of Blinded by the Ooh, Light. So crazy. like it's just a great stat of you know we Wonderwall. look at Wonderwall didn't go number 1 yeah, in the US. And, Me and you have referenced Wonderwall yeah. in the past t- two sessions that we've yeah, been in. Yeah. That's no and no one like I don't know man. You can only do what you feel led to do and what like 
honestly, why be an artist? Why be a writer? Now that I'm back to writing for people again, it's only been like a month of me getting back in the studio and whatever. Let's see what comes from it. And maybe that, maybe I nail a bunch of hits and I say, this is great for my life and this is where I'm at right now. In real time, I owe it to my fans to say, I don't know what I want to be. I don't know what I am. I don't know. I don't have life figured out. I don't have this whole thing. All I know is what I find great. How can I remain passionate about what I do and stay balanced? And those three things, if I'm concerned about those things, the product that comes out of those three things might not be relevance, streams, billboard, huh, all right. these things. Because like, what is billboard? Now, now you can, if you have the number one, if you have the number one selling single, every, I don't remember, I quote me if I'm wrong, 14,000 something streams off of anything equates to one album sold. So yeah, people have like the number one albums for weeks on Billboard because one song, put your hands up in the sky and come to the club with me, it, they have the number one album for a bunch of weeks because their single is selling really well. Right. Billboard, streaming numbers, is not equivalent to influence. It, and it is, it's not even remotely close. Some artists care about that stuff. At this point, influence, longevity, truth, trying to find the truth, trying to, and when I find truth, maybe I can give it to a deliver it to the people. That's just what's on my agenda now. Streaming and t- people are getting stream counts now through what they put on their social medias, what you get on Instagram. Oh. If you put, that's, what are we, t- yeah. who cares how many streams you have? Congratulations. Some of the corniest records of all time are the highest streaming, whatever. And when I say corny, I don't mean that in a negative light. I just mean, I love a bunch of corny songs I listen to all the time. It's not that it's, Good or bad, it's just you can't say. But it's bubble gum. I mean, there's bubble gum. Yeah, you and can't, you can't say that it's like it's definably good. There's no there's no definably good metric system, and streams now is not one to is not one to tell that anymore. Well, and the, uh, Pete Gambark, who's one of the presidents of Atlantic, sent me this really cool research that. That showed the difference between the number one song and it was it's a it's like an algorithm built with the mechanics of a song, you know, and let alone the subject matter. But you know, BPMs, tempo, time signature, all okay. that. And the difference between number one songs, the the biggest difference I think in a year had something to do with you know, is maybe like party rock anthem and. Hey there, Delilah. I know that's not right, but it was something like that. Totally. Where the songs were super diverse. But this last year was the short, the smallest difference. And part of it is because a lot of producers are literally pulling up the exact same session they just had, maybe moving the drums around, but Dragging, probably the exact same, drum. exact same drum sounds, exact same tempo, <laughs> oh exact same keyboard, you know, same sample pack. And then same writers in the room, and you're gonna have just a mass amount of quite literally the same exact same. song. And it's just the the differences are, are really hard to tell. And not I don't wanna sound like an old man that's like, well, I can't tell the difference between, you know, this song, that song, like no, oh, it's rap old, these man. days. Just like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't wanna be like property. That. Yeah, 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 <laughs> Get yeah, off yeah. my property. <laughs> but there's something about it that's like that's cl- that's scientifically Really similar totally. between, uh, you know, and and there's a lot of sense in quantifying your art because if you have enough followers on these DSPs, then no matter what you put out, it'll still land in there. Essentially, some some playlist for them to click, and mm-hmm. and they'll get paid regardless of the quality of the music. Yes, and that makes that makes a recipe where unless the artist takes the time to create a you know a glory prep sound situation yep. you you know you could get paid more if you just you know i mean look you were on other records that we don't have to go into that yeah. that are not really part of the brand you know oh, 100%. And, and, but you see like the the value of it, it Cause you, i realize you could either too, go I down can't, a, i you know, can't put myself i can't Ugh. It's hard for me to go on the tear of like people make BS and I'm not bad and I'm a purist artist and da, da, da. I got to be careful because I also love hit records. Like I also love the feeling of accomplishing writing something for somebody else that goes up the chart. We we say 
a couple records that I've done, a couple records that you've done could be looked at as fluff or bubblegum or yes. But that's, I realized the older I get, that's an art in and of itself. And that's way harder to do, to present it to a mass amount of people for it to be successful on a world renowned level and to be applicable. That's like building an iPhone. You're making something that's simple enough for millions of people to grasp, but the complexity of creating the 10,000 hours it takes to get that product over. Yeah. So it's, I got to be careful with how passionate I get about pushing sound forward and doing all these things because I also want to contribute to like making a bunch of iPhones as well. Like yeah. just because somebody makes a rotary phone that's made out of gold and was handmade, like I don't care. I'd rather have an iPhone. Some, sometimes for the situation, when you get out of the club and you're done clubbing for the night and you go home, you want McDonald's. You want a greasy piece of pizza and you're drunk and that's what you want. You don't want a kale shake that's good for you, that's <laughs> good, a, a turkey dinner that's going to sit right. well with your body and help you go to sleep. You want McDonald's. And who's to say, I think in the long run, will some of the morals that's coming from a lot of this stuff and whatever in the long run, is that going to affect you negatively? Of course, just like McDonald's will. But sometimes you need a good Big Mac. Yeah. Like sometimes you need to you need to scratch that itch. Yeah. And that's where there's a time and a place for everything. So it's again, you said optics. keep it balanced. Why do I want to be an artist? Why do I want to be this? There's a balance for everything. I would be honored, honored to have a flow rider smash. I'd be honored for it to sell millions of records. That, that would be the greatest thing ever. I could feed my kids in my kids, 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 kids can have money to go to college through that. That's awesome. And it's and that's hard to do. I also want to do the Rock Marciano string arrangements with the RZA and Quincy Jones. I also want to do that. So at this point, I've learned, honestly, find out what the truth is, try to deliver it to the people, stay as balanced as I can, and don't shoot myself in the foot by saying something stupid that puts me in a mm. position where I can't go tomorrow and work on the Five Seconds of Summer album. If I say, screw all the fluff crap, blah, 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 no one's going to ask me to work on their album. And right. I want to work on as much music and impact the lineage of music throughout history as much as I possibly can. Well, let's go to the next segment because we're yeah. running close on time. Yes. But um, this is our five for five segment where I'm going to name five things and you can just tell me the first thing that comes off the okay. top of your head. All right. Um, visionary music group. Genius. Cara Diaguardi. Trailblazer. Kanye West. Misunderstood. Let's go with... Your siblings. Anchor. And then let's go with your parents. Dependable. Well, here's some uh, two compliments for you. <laughs> First one is that I don't know many artists who are able to put songwriting to the side and then come back to songwriting and have the kind of response you've, you've been getting. Oh, dude! You know Thank it's you. it's awesome because most writers, when they go off to the artist's world, the songwriting game has changed since you were bat- last in it. You know, the first yeah. time we wrote together, I believe, was maybe at Finfer's house. Oh, you God. know, it's like in a Crazy. in an apartment, and then, but you know, it wasn't really the thing that. Yeah, it just wasn't what we were doing. Totally. You know, and and to see to see you go from. A hit writer to being the kind of artist you are to then being able to come into sessions and have everybody lining up to get in the room with you oh, man. is is a testament for your honesty as a musician and as a songwriter well, and you should be really proud of yourself. I gotta so return that's one a compliment. Thing. Hold on, hold on to that second okay. comment. Just so we can put in perspective, because a lot of my fans will listen to this and not put into perspective who you are, and I feel like that needs to be said. I met you at a when I first signed to BMI years ago before our first session. Knew who you were, what you've done, all about it. Like, and everybody that when you walked in the room, everyone in that entire building was like, "Ross is here. Ross is here. He's had the new. Uh. He had the new things session. He has the new this session. He's been working with so and so a lot." I'm like. And I remember in my head, I said, one day I'm going to be honored enough to work with that guy. Like, oh wow! Yeah, no, dude, a hundred percent. And I wish, I wish I was making this up. And I specifically remember putting it in my head. There was always this top tier of like 
the cool club of like LA dudes that are just killing the game that are like, they seem so cool. Like, like it was like a high school thing. Like <laughs> I was like, awesome. they probably just like go to their big houses and like hang out in their pool and like just decide if they want to write a song <laughs> that day. Like, like I was like, I want that. Like in my like tiny apartment in LA. But just so you know, like if, if anyone's listening, like this is, I'm speaking to going to be going down in history as one of the illest playwrights as one of the illest songwriters and one of the most successful musicians on the spinning earth so we have to just make sure that that's oh, like man. that's said to, to Damn, that. we should do this more often <laughs> um okay well then i i get to go out on this one thank you for doing this oh, thank i know you. you have a, a busy schedule um and uh, I, I, we laughed a shitload last week. So I mean, <laughs> so good. I, I just feel like um, anytime we're in a room together, it's going to be a good day, which totally. is the only thing I really care about. But I want to. This is you know, this didn't mean that much to you, I don't think, at the time. But I, I've mentioned this behind your back as what the industry should, the kind of person the industry should be like, and. I, you, you said to me, I don't remember why, but you were like, why don't you come over? I want to play you some some songs, and you played me '80s films, and I said, oh, that'd be interesting, you know, if you move this over here, maybe you do this or something like that. And I, I don't remember if you did it or not, but I, I remember obviously liking the song and being like, this this guy's awesome, and and then I get a call saying. You know, John and wants to make give you additional production on this song or whatever. Oh, it was. I li- yeah, yeah. And man, people in this industry are have so much ego that when when even they're supposed to, they fight against giving credit. Even when when somebody did something that is worthy of that kind of credit on someone's album. You know, they they fight against it because their ego gets in the way, or or it costs money, or whatever the reason is. And you give credit where credit's due, but you give credit sometimes where it's not even due. Totally, and I mean, I appreciate it, but I appreciate you more than anything else because we as a community need to continue to lift each other up and yes. do the nice beef. <laughs> you know, like yeah. we should all be out there and saying congratulations constantly, and that's why I I, I think it's it, the more we support each other as a community, the better we will be compared to the previous hundred years of music, sixty years of music, and we'll make know. more waves for the betterment of writers yes. like you're doing. I mean, I, I don't know how much you've talked about it on the podcast, but like. Coming together as a community, like you're going to be that guy that's going to lead all the writers and producers in the community to, like, I know why you're passionate about that. And it's because I see, like, it's not falling on deaf ears and it's not you just saying it for the fluff of it because you're in the trenches. You're literally on Capitol Hill pushing for our rights as songwriters and the insurance that we deserve and all these different things. Like, bro, the respect level is a th- four million percent mutual. And I couldn't even. Begin to tell you what it means to just to sit down and have a conversation with you as creatives back and forth is a legitimate honor, and it's a, I legitimately feel like I've arrived in a sense just having this conversation with you. Love it. Well, we'll do this again in ten years. There it is. All right, buddy. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of And the Writer Is. If you want to hear music from this songwriter I just interviewed. Be sure to check out our Spotify playlist or visit our website at andthewriteris.com. And the Writer Is is produced by Joe London, edited by Miles Bergsma, and published by Big Deal Music. A special thanks to David Silberstein from Mega House Music and Michael White. Until next time, this is Ross Golden.